welcome to the King's Cross Church. 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 Yes, we welcome you to the King's Cross Church here in Hexhill, Doncaster. King's Cross London was the terminus for the great steam locomotives of the N and the R, like the Fine Scotsman and the Mallard, which were built here in Hexhill. We're not remembering George the Fourth in London but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, the cross of King Jesus. And we're going to sing about him now, born the King of Angels, as we sing the traditional carol, O Come, All Ye Faithful. Christmas time. 
We pray this morning as we listen to the carols, join in some of the singing. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will lift our hearts in praise and in adoration. And we ask, Heavenly Father, you will open our hearts to receive your word and to be obedient to whatever you teach us and call us to do. We come as men and women and young people and children, conscious of our failures, conscious of our inability to love you with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our strength. But we thank you, Lord, that with you there is forgiveness. And we thank you as we come to you with open hearts, penitent hearts. You offer us again a clean heart and a new start. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the cross of our Lord Jesus. He who was mocked as he hung on the cross, the King of the Jews, they said. We thank you, Lord, that he is King of creation. And we pray that as we worship him, and read his word this morning, we ask, Lord, that his name will be honoured and glorified. We ask these things in his name and for his glory. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Uh, you will see that we're looking at the birthplaces of uh, well-known people. I'll just give you a few, uh, one or two minutes, just look at these two lists and see if you can match uh, the people on the left with their birthplace on the right. You'll see that on the list of birthplaces there are one or two places that will be unfamiliar perhaps to some of you uh, and certainly to a wider audience and they are places that are famous only because of the person on the left on the in the list on the left uh, hopefully most of you will see Epworth at the top right uh, that was the birthplace of John Wesley and it's certainly true to say that any fame that Epworth has is entirely related to the Wesley family we also see lower down on the right hand column uh, Eam we know what Eam is famous for the uh, epidemic uh, in 1665 and the name of uh, William Mompesson who I guess was not actually born in uh, Eam but certainly was very well known there as the vicar who helped in their policy of isolating themselves from the rest of the country and Osterfield bottom right uh, was the birthplace of William Bradford uh, he was one of the members of the Pilgrim Fathers who went to America uh, 400 years ago in 1620 and in fact he became the, first, the second governor of the colony there. And then there are other places, I suppose, less, not really famous, but uh, will reflect a little in the glory, I suppose, of certain famous people who came from there. I think Harold Wilson, of course, in Huddersfield, and Margaret Thatcher in uh, Grantham, uh, Kevin Keegan there from uh, Doncaster, he who became the European Footballer of the Year on two occasions. Uh, sadly, Doncaster Road was considered he was too small, so uh, he went to Scunthorpe originally. Uh, and uh, Barnsley, the birthplace of Hudson Taylor, the man very much uh, appreciated by the Chinese people, uh, many of whom today still trace their ancestry, as it were, their Christian ancestry, back to this uh, Methodist man who came from Barnsley. You notice that the uh, Bethlehem appears twice in the list. Uh, King David uh, came from Bethlehem, uh, and of course we see Jesus of Nazareth there, with his birthplace of Bethlehem. And there, of course, was some slight confusion even 
in the time of Jesus as to why Jesus of Nazareth, why was he known as Jesus of Nazareth, and yet his birthplace was Bethlehem. And this morning, later on, we'll be looking at Micah chapter 5, uh, where we read the prophecy that there would be someone very significant born in Bethlehem. And even during the time of Jesus, there were those who rejected him as the Messiah because they said, will anyone famous come from Nazareth? Uh, they did not know the fact that Jesus uh, was in, or his parents were in Bethlehem at the time when he was born. And it is one of the remarkable things in history, one of the most remarkable fulfillments of prophecy that Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem because, of course, they'd been living in Nazareth. Uh, the angel had told them, told Mary that she was to have a child, and it was because of what a Roman emperor said, Caesar Augustus, who decreed that there should be a census of all the people in the empire. And so Mary and Joseph went to the city of David, which was their hometown, as it were, the town, the town where their ancestry uh, was based. And so they were in Bethlehem just at the time when Jesus was born. And so that prophecy was remarkably fulfilled. You may go through this list and uh, you may find, well, possibly one name that you're not quite sure where he belongs. Well, if you know all the others, you might work out where his birthplace was and be able to see the significance of that name and that place. But for the moment, we're just thinking of Bethlehem as the birthplace of Jesus and we're going to go on to sing that well known carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. First Bible readings from Micah 5, verses 1 to 5. Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for our siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, 
Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labour bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of his name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortress. The second Bible read is from Matthew 2 verses 1 to 8. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who is born the King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chiefs and teachers of the law, he asked them, where, where will, will the Messiah be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so I may go back and worship him. So now let's pray together as we think of the needs of others uh, and the world. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're able to listen to your word. We thank you for this reminder of the prophecies that were made and of the events as Jesus was born and of these people who came to worship him. We pray, Lord, that you will stir our hearts at the wonder of these events once again. Forgive us for over-familiarity, but we thank you, Lord, that this time of the year we can focus our thoughts on the birth of Jesus, God incarnate, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that our hearts will be filled with wonder. We want to pray, Lord, for our church in the present circumstances. We thank you for the ministries that are continuing. Thank you for this medium online. We thank you for other activities taking place online and sometimes uh, face to face. We thank you for the youth activities and all the work that Jess is doing in these days. And we pray, Lord, that it will be fruitful. We pray for the visits, the visitation that is going on, for those who are on their own and we pray, Lord, that we may all regularly pray for our friends and neighbours, and we think especially, Lord, of those in our fellowship who are living on their own, and we just name them in our hearts before you. We pray, Lord, that hopefully this period will be at an end soon, and we ask, Lord, that in the meantime, and especially at this Christmas time, that you will fill our hearts with your peace. Jesus came to bring peace. The angels sang about peace. The prophecies said that it would be Jesus who would bring peace. And we ask, Lord, that whether on our own or with our family or wherever, we ask, Lord, that the peace of Christ will reign, rule our hearts. We pray for our minister John and Jackie and Bethany. We ask, Lord, that you bless them this Christmas time. We pray that you will bless John to full health and strength, Lord, and we look forward to his continuing leadership of our church. We pray for Richard and for our stewards, our leadership team, Lord. Uh, we have so many things to think about at the moment. We just thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who leads and guides us. We thank you for the news of the vaccine and we pray, Heavenly Father, we please you that this will prove uh, to be effective and we pray for the logistics of getting these vaccines out to the population, especially first of all to those who are in particular need. 
granddaughter in the future, the other vaccines presently being tested uh, will become available. And uh, we pray, Lord, that in our thankfulness and our relief at this news, we pray that we will be thankful to you, Lord. We thank you for the skill that you give. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help the government at this time, this very stressful time. We think of the uh, Brexit negotiations that are continuing, and we ask, Heavenly Father, that whatever is the outcome, that these things will be proved to be uh, a blessing and a help to our country, and indeed, that the Europe too uh, will feel uh, that they have not uh, suffered a great deal or lost a great deal. We enter, Lord, into difficult waters, as it were, as we discuss these things, but we pray, Heavenly Father, that your hand will be upon these negotiations. And we know, Lord, as decades later, as people look back, they will see how these things turn out. We pray, Lord, that it will be in ways that we do not understand now work out for the furtherance of your kingdom and the gospel, not only in our country, Lord, but in the countries of Europe. And we continue to pray, Lord, for, for the spread of the gospel, for the strengthening of your church, how we appreciate, how we know it is weak and seems to be a weakening. We ask, Lord, for the blessing of your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this land. We ask, Lord, there may be a return to you a realisation that you are our creator, you are the sustainer of the universe. And uh, we pray, Lord, as we have been doing, especially in December for the United States, this particular juncture of their history and for the change in administration. We pray, Lord, for the unity of the people of that country. We pray, Lord, that where there is division, you will bring healing. And we pray, Lord, that over these coming months and years that you will unite that country, even if not in polit particular political uh, policies or schemes, but Lord, we pray that in their hearts they may recognise that you are their God. And we pray again for as for our own country for a return to you. We read and hear that this country that was based so much on faith in God, in God we trust, so many of their early founders were men and women of true faith. We pray, Lord, that there will be a revival of that faith in you, the living God. And we ask, Lord, too, at this time for the persecuted church, for Christians throughout the world. The horror stories that are regularly appearing on our television screens and monitors as we read of deaths and churches being burned. And the horrific hostility that is being shown to your people. We remember, Lord, at this time how hostility was directed at your son, Jesus, right at the beginning of his birth. And through those three decades, so much hostility and unfriendliness and enmity. We thank you, Lord, that you brought him through all that and gloriously raised him from the dead. We pray, Lord, that all who suffer now throughout the world will know that their labour and their faith, their trust, their perseverance is not in vain. Because one day they will see you in all your glory. And so we pray that you'll bless your church in Africa and in India and in China and in the countries in between and on the other continents of North and South America and Australia. New Zealand and indeed through Europe. We pray, Lord, that the name of Christ will be uplifted during this Christmas period, that people's hearts will be turned to you. Maybe many will have time, more time for reflection than normal Christmases. We pray, Lord, that people will read the Christmas story. They will seek to understand why this baby is born. been a suggestion by some that we should have a united, a joined up celebration of Christmas and Easter, a Christa, has been not very much to say for it, except it does actually link the fact that this baby who is born at Christmas did die upon the cross at Easter and was raised from the dead. We 
friend or this understanding might dawn on the hearts of many people as they think about these things. So help us now, Heavenly Father, we ask as we continue to worship you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Joy has dawned upon the world from its falling nation. God's salvation now unfurled, hope for every nation. Not with darkness or above, not with sins of glory, but a humble gift of love. Jesus, born of Mary. Sounds of wonder fill the sky with the songs of angels as the mighty prince of voice tells us in a stable hands that set each star in place shapes the earth shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and they will live securely for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth and he will be their peace. We're familiar now with the fact that parents if they wish can know the sex or gender of their unborn baby some months before the birth and prepare accordingly. Of course it was not always so. I remember the Chinese school in Malaysia, which I taught uh, many years ago, the headmaster there uh, announced at the prize giving at the school sports day to quite a crowd of people that his wife, unfortunately, had not been able to be present because she had uh, gone into the hospital to give birth to their first son. They already had a daughter. Uh, I arrived at that school uh, two months later when the baby was two months old. The baby's name was Christine Joy. So much for his prophecy that uh, he was going to have a boy. Mary, we know, was told that she was going to have a baby boy nine months uh, earlier. But here in Micah, in the prophet, prophecy of Micah, we see that a special boy is going to be born in Bethlehem, 700 years before the event. I want us, first of all, to Think about the remarkable book the Bible is, of Scripture, and what this particular uh, passage
passage, this particular prophecy, tells us about God. How do we know actually that these, that this verse, these verses are speaking about Jesus? Isn't it rather an obscure passage that people have lifted out? Well, of course, as we go through the New Te the Old Testament, we find that there are various verses and passages which appear to speak of some event or some person beyond the immediate situation. And there are many examples of this. One of the clearest is the example that Peter gave uh, at Pentecost uh, when he quoted the psalmist uh, David who had written or spoken the words, you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see corruption. And Peter pointed out that David could not possibly have been speaking about himself because his tomb was there in Jerusalem. And Peter explained that in fact David was speaking about the resurrection of the Messiah who was to come. And some of these verses through the Old Testament were picked up by students of the scripture, not all of them were picked up, certainly those about the death of the Messiah, but many of them were picked up as referring to someone who would come to save them, the Messiah. The words Messiah and Christ are actually have the same meaning. Messiah is a Hebrew word and Christ or Christos is the Greek version of it, meaning the anointed one. Uh, Iranians, for example, as they come to the end of their prayer, they will always pray in the name of al the Messiah. I think as, if you think about it, we tend to use the word Messiah uh, when we're thinking of the one who is to come. Uh, but when we're normally referring to Jesus in the Gospels, we think we, we use the phrase Jesus Christ. But all the time we could say Jesus the Messiah. And uh, the Messiah here is... Uh, heralded, as it were, as one who is going to be born in Bethlehem. The situation when this prophecy was made was that Assyria were besieging Israel, in particular uh, the northern parts of that country. And these were words of encouragement to think that although Israel is being attacked now, one day there will come one who will be a ruler who will bring peace. Earlier, very early in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 49, when Jacob was blessing uh, his 12 sons, when he came to Judah, he said, the scepter will not depart from Judah until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. Well, what a fantastic, incredible thing to say that one of his sons, from him, remembering how few the people of Israel were at that stage with uh, Jacob and his, uh, his family, his extended family, that to one of them, the nations would bring obedience. And yet we find in Romans, Paul speaks about the fact that he'd been called by God to preach the gospel in order to bring the nations to the obedience of faith. And at the end of Romans, he says, the proclamation of Jesus Christ is in order that all nations might believe and obey him. So some of these things, some of these prophecies were picked up and understood by the learned scribes and of the scriptures and so on. And they knew that it said that they had interpreted this right, and that when the wise men came to Jerusalem looking for the one who was born king of the Jews, the Herod called the chief, chief priests and the scribes and asked them, well, where is the Messiah to be born? And they knew, they said, oh, in Bethlehem. Uh, so did those in the, in the temple later on in the ministry of Jesus. You remember when people were disputing who Jesus was, uh, some of them said, but how can the Christ come from Galilee? He can't be the Christ. He's from Galilee. Does not the scripture say the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? And the people were divided over this. So that there was knowledge that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And so the wise men, of course, went looking for him. And as I said earlier on in the service, 
It is simply remarkable that Mary and Joseph should be in Bethlehem at that time because of what Emperor Caesar Augustus had decreed. And I hope you can see that this example, just one of many, uh, indicates what a remarkable book the Bible is. And what this uh, feature of the Bible tells us about the God of the Bible, that God is in control of history, that history is not going round in a circle, but it is, as we say, linear, it is a line, there is a beginning, and it is going towards an end to a climax. There is a plan, and the plan is being worked out, and God knows the future. And God knows all about us. As the psalmist said, you know when I sit down, you know when I stand, you know what I'm going to say, I cannot get away from you, you knew me before I was born. And when Jesus was on earth, he said, even the hairs of your head are on them, but God knows all about you. Remember how David looked at it from another point of view when he said, when I consider the heavens, the moon and the stars, what is man that you are mindful of him? And whether we're looking through a microscope or whether we're looking through a telescope, God's knowledge is complete. And we can also say, not only that God is in control, not only that God knows all about us, but we can say that his purposes are good. We should speak about his providence, his providence, his providential care. And we're still in the habit, getting into the habit again of just believing that science uh, is what is going to help us, get us out of our present difficulties. In fact, it's stated quite bold, isn't it? Science will see us through and a complete failure to recognise, as has been said, that scientists are really thinking the thoughts of God after him. And it is God to whom we should give thanks. Yes, we appreciate the scientists, we appreciate their knowledge and their expertise and all that they're doing, but all things come from God ultimately. And it is our sense of God that has been lost, and sadly during this hiatus when life has been put on hold, uh, when there's really been an opportunity to take stock of our lives, one gets the impression that most people are just going to continue as they were before. So, so much about the scripture, what it tells us. Uh, secondly, Bethlehem and what it tells us about Jesus. In some ways, Bethlehem was no big deal. It's been mentioned a few times in the scripture. It's the place where Ruth and Naomi from Moab arrived at the time of the barley harvest and of course Ruth settled there but she was eventually to be the great grandmother of David the king the shepherd boy who was king of Israel at the height of its development like Epworth Bethlehem was not significant in itself but because Mary and Joseph were descended from David there they had to return to the census and there the Messiah was born the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem tells us the kind, something about the kind of king that he was going to be. One commentator suggested that when the wise men were told that he was to be born in Bethlehem, that news, uh, that, that news was as significant as what it did not say as what it did say. They'd gone to Jerusalem uh, ex expecting, presumably, that uh, this new king would be born there, possibly in Herod's palace. And if not there, as a spirit, new spiritual leader, perhaps he would be born in the temple. Whether they ever knew the circumstances of his birth in a stable, we don't know, because as, we, as you'll be familiar uh, with the fact that when they came, we, it is said that they entered the house uh, where the family were. But this man born king was like no other. Yet these men gave gifts that were appropriate for him. Gifts that indicated royalty, deity. And yet he was the one who later was to say, I am meek and lowly of heart. Come to me and you will find rest for your souls. There was no arrogance. He was a carpenter, the breadwinner. Since his father died, 
as we understand. Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He went about doing good. Read about him in the Gospels and see what kind of king this man was. The life of Jesus is all of a piece. Born in a stable, taken to Egypt as a refugee. And like King David, the shepherd who killed Goliath with one stone of his sling, but then went on to rule with the heart of a shepherd. This was the model, as it were, for Jesus. Of whom Isaiah said, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs to him. And we think of Jesus with gathering children to him. Let the children come to me, gently leading those who were with young. And then living in Nazareth for 30 years. Did anything good come out of Nazareth? Said Nathaniel. Is there any clue in the Old Testament that Nazareth was going to be significant? Well, there is. I think only in one place. And that is in Isaiah chapter 9. Where Isaiah spoke about the fact that Zebulun and the land of Naphtali being humbled. Spoke about the darkness but where a great light would come. Because in the future, God will honour Galilee of the Gentiles. Understand that Zebulun and Nephthali were the first areas to feel the power of Assyria. And in those days, as these ruthless invaders came, uh, the idea of a war crime was, of course, something quite uh, beyond their understanding. And the cruelty was terrible. But Nazareth was to be honoured because 700 years later there was to be one who was to walk the paths of Nazareth and was to enter the synagogue there. Jesus, the Son of God. And there were two other features in these Messiah passages, indeed in this passage in Micah that are worth mentioning. One was about a child. Isaiah 7 speaks to the virgin who will be with child. Chapter 9, after it's been talking about the darkness and so on, speaks of a child who is to be born. And in Isaiah chapter 11, where we read about the future, where the wolf will lie with the lamb and the lion with the calf, we read that a little child shall lead them. And here in Micah, verse 3, it speaks of the time when she who is in labour will give birth. These phrases are all suggesting that there will be a special child, a special baby born. And then again, in these passages, there is a world vision. Here in Micah, chapter 5, verse 4. His greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. This is Jesus again, just thinking how weak and limited Israel was when these words were spoken. And yet there is this vision that this Messiah who is to come, his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And Isaiah in his famous passages also says the same in several places. He will be a light to light of the Gentiles. Chapter 11, his earth, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. His fame will reach to the ends of the earth when Israel was so small. What a contrast between the situation of Israel here as Assyria comes threatening and ultimately to conquer with the prophecy that one day there will be one whose greatness will reach to the ends of the earth and who will bring peace. We're going to sing now again about Bethlehem, born in the night. Born in the night, Mary's child, a long way from your home. Shining light, Mary. 
we've seen what a remarkable book the Bible is, what it tells us about God. And we've seen how Bethlehem became famous because of who was born there. And what it tells us about Jesus and the kind of king he was going to be. His nature and his character. I didn't mention those rather enigmatic phrases uh, in verse 2 where it speaks of him whose origins are from of old, from ancient times, uh, which seem to refer, they're not ever so clear, but seem to refer to the pre-existence of this one who is to come, referred to elsewhere as the ancient of days. But the thing is, how can you be a king without a kingdom? There are sad stories of the royal houses of Europe, kings and queens without a kingdom, who turn up every so often on major celebrations in our royal family usually among them descendants of Queen Victoria. But as soon as Jesus was born, he was a king. Mary, Queen of Scots, became queen, I think, as an eight-year-old baby. But Jesus was born a king. And in fact, immediately, he had a kingdom. Angels worshipped him, born the king of angels. The shepherds had been to see him and had spread the news. They were the lowest in the social order. The, the other end of the scale, the Magi, were on their way to worship him with gifts, indicating, as we've seen, what a special baby he was. He already had a kingdom, men and women who were acknowledging him in their hearts and worshipping him. And in fact, he was already an international kingdom. This was not something simply in the future. No, already. These Persian king, kings had come, as we sometimes sing, from lands afar, because it was Persian, modern Iran, that they most probably came from. And uh, Micah tells us, he will be their peace. Why then did they have to flee from Herod? Jesus later said he'd come not to bring peace but a sword. We think of the church persecuted today in so many different countries. But Jesus came to bring peace of the most fundamental nature. And 700 years later, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, He, Jesus himself, is our peace. Peace in the hearts of men and women who acknowledge his, king, his kingship. One day his kingdom will be avert, it will be visible, and every knee shall bow. An international kingdom of light, of justice, and of freedom, of peace and security where there will be no more fear or crying or death. But not yet. Here on earth now we see the kingdom of God, of Satan, in retreat. He will put up a desperate fight. Just as when surrender took place at the end of World War II, the most dangerous people were those who were not able to accept defeat. And in the jungles of Southeast Asia, the most desperate fighting took place. Soldiers who knew their country had been overwhelmed and had surrendered, but would not accept it. And on a smaller scale, I guess, government people in the US and certainly the new administration are nervous about some of the seemingly erratic decisions the president is taking now, now that he knows his days are numbered. Around the world, we see the scale of the persecution of the church in so many lands. But Satan's time is limited. His days are numbered. But the wonderful thing is that we can enter his kingdom now. Paul says that Jesus is our peace in the sense that he has destroyed the hostility between the human race and God and between each other and brought us together to reconcile us to God and to each other. So that here now we can experience the peace described as passing understanding. But of course there is one condition. We have to accept his rule. He is the king. It means repentance and the, the obedience of faith. It means recognising that fundamental shift from ruling my own life, doing what I want, being what I want to be, Allowing my life to revolve around him, his purposes, his plan, his will, his word, his rule.
remembering that his rule is sweet. May your kingdom come, O Lord, we pray. May your will be done on earth as in heaven. Amen. O come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always.